Well, today on this day, we head forward into the season of Christmas. I'm going to grab something else here in just a minute. And as we go forward towards Christmas, we pass through a couple of elements of Christianity. When someone says uh, it's incarnation season, what does that make us think of? Christmas. So what does incarnation mean? Made flesh. God in flesh. All right. If someone says Advent, what does it make us think of? Pardon? Yeah, we're going to break with tradition here, and we're going to use some high technology to get some answers. Okay, Google. What is Christmas? Christmas, the annual Christian festival celebrating Christ's birth held on December 25th in the Western Church. In the Western Church. Now, that's talking about this hemisphere, this side of the globe. Okay, Google. What is the season of Advent? According to Wikipedia, Advent is a season observed in many Western Christian churches as a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the Nativity of Jesus at Christmas. Advent is a season or a time observed a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus at Christmas. The term is a version of the Latin word meaning coming. Fascinating. Okay, Google. What is the incarnation of Jesus? According to Wikipedia, in Christian theology, the doctrine of the Incarnation holds that Jesus, the pre-existent divine Logos, coined Greek for Word, and the second hypostasis of the Trinity, God the Son and Son of the Father, taking on a human body and human nature, was made flesh and conceived in the womb of Mary the Theotokos, Greek for. Now that's a mouthful and some more. But what it's saying that an entity a deity was given bones and covered with flesh. Now, there is a tremendous amount more material that can be read on this online. Now, we just used Google and Wikipedia to get those answers. Now, the last one, when we talked about the incarnation of Jesus, it had all these terms about hypostasis and other stuff. That's stuff we can leave at the door. The incarnation is really about a godly entity or God being made man. Now, when we think of Christmas... What is the first thing that comes to your minds? Nancy, I get to pick on you first. Okay. And you know what? You just told us how the world looks at this. We are programmed not to look at Christ first and not to look at him foremost. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So Nancy is pointing at her background having potentially been a part of getting her where she is and what she understands. Uh, by the way, Angie and Deborah and Eileen are on the phone with us today. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so what do you think of when you think of Christmas, Dave? Well, first, my first thought goes Christmas tree and like. Okay. How about you, Barry? Then I get the other outside. So Barry says that she has intentionally learned to think about Christ first and to think about what that means, and then the other outside influences come in secondarily. Yasmina, what does what comes to your mind the very first thing when you think of Christmas? Stress <laughs> is a lot of stress because I don't know where where I want to be with my boys, my family, my parents, and for Christmas, who is the one I really want to spend Christmas with? They make it so stressful. You know, I feel I feel joy. I I. I have an attitude that the majority of people around the holidays, holidays, they get more joyful, they get more cheerful, they they have a different uh, aura about them. They they look happy, you know, and you say, happy, uh, you know, Merry Christmas, and they say, Merry Christmas to you, you know. We know the reason for the season is Jesus, you know, and so I have a shop, and I'm always saying, God bless you when they they leave, and a lot of people say, thank you. Thank you. People don't say that anymore. And Merry Christmas the same. Everyone's afraid of saying Merry Christmas. They all say Happy Holiday, you know. And it's a different, I think there's more joy and there's more people are happy, you know, on the holidays. You're talking about the character of Christmas coming out and being spoken and being shared with people. You're talking about remembering a season with words and imparting that connection to people in what you say. Now, for me, when I think of Christmas, the very first thing that comes to my mind is a tree. It was a hemlock. They are sparse. They don't have a lot of branches. On a six-foot tree, there might be four or five rows of branches covered in tinsel with lights that are big, fat, colored bulbs. And when one bulb quits, they all quit. And I was the one who got to unscrew each bulb and put a new one in until it came back on. I also remember eating Krumkaka, Fatiman, Divinity, Lefsa, cinnamon rolls, fresh whole milk from a cow. I remember being with all my cousins. Now, mind you, on the block I lived on was my family, my dad's brother's family, their mom, my grandma, and then down the block farther was a couple of my mom's sisters. So family was congested on our street. And I remember that time spent with them. I also remember the first Christmas that I have a clear memory of. My dad was chuckling the whole time through everything. And then he looked at me and said, you need to go downstairs to the basement. And he did this deliberately. He said, I think Santa was down there. I heard noise last night. and I." Oh, wow. Zoom down the stairs. And here was half the basement full of a Lionel train set 
that had working grain elevators, coal cars. It had a logging camp, and you could run it all remotely. I got in trouble the first night because I didn't want to come up and go to bed. But it came down to that point where I realized that Christmas is about things when it comes to the world. There are some churches and some church people that make it about things. Uh, one of them can be the things of a pageant, a show, a huge concert. And I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but it's a thing. And uh, the truth of it all is, does those things, do they point at and take you right to Christ? Do they take you right to the deity of Jesus, who was a man? And you know what? If they don't, we have a blessing. We can work on what Barry has mastered, putting our mind and our heart in a place where we first go to Christ. You know, the question is, do you turn and run from evil and run right straight to God? Oh, that's familiar. I heard somebody say that before. Christmas is also about a couple of other things. If I say spiritual Christmas, what does that mean? What does that bring to your mind? Dave, I'm going to pick on you now. Well, first of all, we know that Jesus was not born on December 25th. And therefore, it's when man has chosen to celebrate his exact birth. So you're describing the way we honor the Trinity and the presence of Jesus as Jesus Christ. Barry, how about you? What do you think of when someone says spiritual Christmas? I think of my, my family and what we did when I was young. That was Bible or When I think of spiritual Christmas, I remember the Christmas pageant for the adults in the church I grew up in when I was little, and then the Christmas pageant for the children, where everybody acted out the whole story. Everybody played a role. Sometimes one person was Herod, somebody else was Joseph, somebody else was Mary. And that pageant stuck in my mind because it was fun. And now where I stand in life, when I think of spiritual Christmas, I think of how close I've come to not being here and how many times that has happened. One of those times, even dying. And I think of the blessing that I have to be able to stand here and do my job and share who I am because of Jesus. But I also know and I also remember that in spiritual Christmas, I remember that I have no hope. I have no chance of survival. I would not be here except for Jesus and his ultimate gift to mankind. Now, this is a very, very frivolous question to ask at this time, but it makes a point. Would we, would you guys do what Jesus did intentionally? For mankind. 
Now, intellectually, it can be easy to say yes, but it can be a whole lot harder to say it in person. And yet, life calls us to sometimes shut up and get up on the metaphorical cross for someone who needs that. They need that love. They need that example. They need to see in action, not hear about it. So Jesus, having come as man and God fully, having given the Holy Spirit, as the Father said, what would you say the benefit that Jesus brought to the world is? Life? Life. Well, okay, and I'll, I'll add a little teeny bit to that statement. Eternal life now becomes real. Dave? I had a thought that uh, now I've almost forgotten. Because <laughs> that happens. <laughs> but uh, um, my thought was, dealing with uh, not only uh, here and now, but later. And uh, I was thinking about, well, and I don't remember what I've said here in church, but I could have died easily and, and not ever lived because I was a preemie that weighed less than, less than three pounds. And so, uh, Jesus gave me life in reality. So uh, uh, that's a part of my thinking. You're talking about mankind's predestination to be individuals that live because of Jesus. I like that. So, what is the side effect that comes out of Jesus? having been born, and he is here for us. What is another side effect? Nancy said life, and I said, well, okay, even eternal life. Nancy? Oh, well, I was kind of thinking when I said life made us, then he saves us, then he gives abundance, life. Out of so in answer your next question. Okay. Well, your answer is profound. People in a third world country, a third world nation, who come to know Jesus, what do they find that is inside of his story that spills all over them? Love, joy, peace, keep going. Grace. Hope, hope for a new beginning, for a new life, for enough life, for enough food, hope for tomorrow, hope for next year, hope. What is hope? In the Old Testament, in the New Testament combined, in the King James, hope is mentioned 121 times. Out of that, there's nearly two dozen different meanings for hope in the Old Testament. One means having possession and choice to use it as you see fit. Another one means grouping like a pond of water, like a platoon of men, and that group is called a hope. Now, that is all the way from back in Jesus' time that that term was used. But when you get to the New Testament, there are only five meanings of hope. Three are inconsequential shirt tail relatives of the two main ones. 
And the two main ones talk about two things. It talks about confidence. It talks about assurance. It talks about my words, interpreting a paragraph, a guaranteed blessing that is secure. But it talks about one other thing. It talks about love, willingness, desire to partake. And it qualifies that statement at the end with willingly. Hope is that desire to participate and be a part of and to be interactive and have relationship with and be part of ownership in hope and to do it in confidence. Now, why would hope need confidence in communication? Yes, why would the people back in the, the time of Greek life, the knowledge of Jesus is there in and amongst the Greek people. Hope is discussed. Christ is, is discussed. Why would there be confidence in that hope in Christ? Pardon? Faith? Yeah, I, was, I was thinking that confidence is, is actually a, a piece of hope. Interesting. If Jesus comes and he brings hope to mankind, it is the hope of what? The hope of salvation, the hope of eternal life, the hope of forgiveness, the hope of grace and mercy. We've said all those things. But in that hope that Jesus comes and brings to us and we live inside of, do we quit sinning? No. We try. We think about it. We plan for it. We're made what by Jesus' death? Pure and clean. Free of our debt that sin puts upon us. We know we're human. We know we sin. We understand details about that from Paul writing in Romans. Do you think the hope that is Jesus might need some private communication between us? and God, and us, and Jesus, and us, and the Holy Spirit, oh, yeah. in confidence? What would that be for? To confess sins. To confess the innermost desires of our heart. To confess those secret longings we have that only God can give, and only Jesus can make happen. To be able to say thank you, like a young child does, right in dad's ear, and gives dad a big old bear hug. The hope of Christ brings with it confidence in what is promised and has become reality, but it also brings the confidential opportunity to share our innermost being in our innermost desires and wants with God and Jesus. Yasmina expressed it wonderfully, very, very, very well stated, that it can be stressful. It can be traumatic. It can be frustrating, especially if it's not what you seek and the way you seek it. But I'm here to tell you this, that even in that case, hope with confidence, and confidence is believing, it is knowing, 
leaves us a private communication path with God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. Yes, ma'am. Think of David. Think of him as king, doing his kingly things and executing his authority. How do you think David's story would have gone if the hope he held did not allow him to confidentially communicate with God? How would David have functioned if he didn't have the ability to go to God with every single thing? Oh, and so now we're talking about other stories in the Bible, and we can look at those and see what happened when it wasn't that way. Yes, seriously stressed out. But because of Jesus' birth and because of his presence in our lives, in us, there is hope that transcends all other hope. Because what Jesus brings is forgiveness and eternal life. And the eternal life isn't the life a lot of people think it is. It's not cars, houses, money. It's not all those things. It's joy, love, peace, all the fruits of the Spirit. But this comes down to one other thing as well. With Jesus being our hope, and with Jesus being our salvation, do you realize that Jesus has power and authority that God himself does not have? The Bible explains multiple places. No one else can be saved unless they come through me. God didn't say that. Christ did. The fishes and the loaves. God didn't say, okay, I'll multiply the fishes and the loaves. Jesus said, bring me what you have. And the truth of that miracle, it was, a, it was more like 15,000 people that they fed than the number we see of 5,000. Because it wasn't customary to count women and children in that day and age. Jesus and the hope he brought spilled out onto people, so much so that one person knew they only had to touch the tassel on the hem of his garment. Now, did they believe in the garment or Jesus? She believed in Jesus. And she knew that this symbolic act of touching the tassel on the hem of his garment would be enough effort to acquire and receive the hope in action in her life. Our hope, our hope in Christ is based upon what we know, what we've been taught, what we have seen, what we have experienced. Our hope is based upon many things, but the one thing it needs to be built upon, it needs to be the foundation is relationship. And relationship is found hearing from God through the book we call the Bible, through friends like today, through other Christians who come and share, and we share with them. Hope is also brought to us through the miracles of joining Jesus on his mission, not our mission, but coming alongside him and participating where he is. And that hope frequently spills onto other people. It lands on them. We've already been given a rich share, and we should be looking at sharing that. Hope springs forth. 
and it lifts people up. When we say hope lifts people up, what are we talking about? Does do they, If I say I might have $5 for you to eat lunch at McDonald's, if I say that to a homeless guy on this corner, what does he think? What does he take to heart from that statement? Well, I, when I say I might, doubtful, doubtful. If I say, well, I think the baby's due next week, what does mom know? Ha! Ha! Mom knows. That's a guess. But Jesus isn't a guess. He's not doubtful. He's true. He's vibrant. He is what makes us who we are now. So as we live in hope, we need to live in that hope. Not 100%. Not the best we can do. We need to live in that hope, giving all and receiving all. Hope is not about, I tried a little bit. It's not about, well, that was the best I could do. Hope in Christ is about all in. It's about fully vested. It's about committing even to the unknown. Hope is about those kinds of things. And in this season of hope, as we pass through the Advent season, and we consider the incarnation of Jesus, remember that hope is what he brought to the world to the mankind, to lost souls. Now, I throw this at you to consider. Before a lot of time went by with Thomas and the disciples, do you think the disciples noticed that Thomas didn't exactly believe the way they did? Sure they did. They knew. There's a reason he was called Doubting Thomas. Now, if Thomas doubted and did not believe everything, and Jesus continued to lead him and keep him following and educate him and fill him and give him knowledge, and then even at the right moment, bring him over and call him to touch that wound, and Thomas suddenly became a believer. What does that say about hope? Hope walked with Thomas all those months, despite his unbelief. And it did not deter Jesus one bit. And when the father said, now would be a good time, son, Jesus called Thomas over and provided him what he sought was belief. And that belief was no longer an if or a maybe. That belief was reality. Barry. Wow, how simple and elegant. His faith matured. Do you think Thomas found hope suddenly that he had not seen before in that moment? I'm sure he did. Go ahead, Nancy. I will tell you this. Strong's is full of the word expectancy and assured in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's conting contingency-based. If you do this, this is what you get. But in the New Testament, it's assurance. It's 
um, promised, fulfilled. It's owned as in, I am waiting to receive my hope. So look at this as you go about your lives in this time, as we move towards Christmas, and know that hope was even strong enough, powerful enough, and big enough to carry Peter through his times. The hope that Jesus brought gave Peter the strength to get out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. It even gave Peter the strength to go through denying Christ and still stand and say, I am his disciple. The hope that Jesus brought even covered Judas. Imagine that. It even covered Judas. Jesus didn't say, you're of no value. Go away. You're not going to make it. Jesus did his job, and Judas did his. But in that, we have Christ who continues to walk with these men, and Peter becomes the cornerstone of the church. The other disciples go on to do what they do. Thomas is no longer doubting Thomas. Hope is what gets us all in. Hope is what brings us to be able to be 100% committed. The hope of our future, the hope of eternal life, the hope of the blessing of salvation. So remember, hope one of the things that the season of Advent is all about, hope is the cornerstone of a lot of what Jesus brought to people. Just think for a moment about the woman at the well. As soon as she found out who he was, she knew he should not be talking to her, culturally or socially. And all of a sudden, she sees he's not like all the others that come from his land. And she finds hope in this wonderful man. What did she call him? She called him a uh, prophet. She called Jesus a prophet. Hope is supposed to be a part of our identity and a part of who we are daily, minute by minute, hope. And God's desire, Christ's want for us, and the Holy Spirit wants our brain to work like Barry said. I had to retrain myself to run to God first and to consider all of these spiritual things, and then the other things later. Easily said, not so easily done. Let's pray, and then we're going to have another song, and uh, we'll be finished here. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this season of Advent, and for the fact that this is the week of hope. We thank you for the fact that the next week is the week of peace. It's the week of coming to terms and being able to live with the peace that only comes from the Holy Spirit. We are grateful for that. And we thank you for the incarnation of Christ, you having been brought to us, holy man and holy God. What a blessing. We thank you for the hope that is found in Jesus' life. We ask you to let us spread it and spill it out on everybody else. Bless those who are not here with us. We thank you for them, too. We are grateful that Yasmina and her friend are able to come visit. That is a rich gift for us. We love her. 
and we love the people in the community. Thank you for calling us to give them hope, even if it's only for a couple of hours twice a week. We thank you for these things because they are given by your desire, God. They are given by your hands, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, they are manipulated and manifested into what the Father wants through you and what you speak into us. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen.